Have you ever heard the phrase, I've become my own worst enemy? Well, in the case of patients with autoimmune disorders, that's actually true. And we're gonna talk about it today as we talk about systemic lupus erythematosus. So systemic lupus erythematosus, or lupus for short, or SLE for short, is an autoimmune disorder where the body attacks itself. The immune system gets all mixed up and starts fighting the good guys. So let's break down this, this, di this uh, title here to help us understand this better. Systemic means it affects multiple organs. It causes damage throughout the body. Erythematosus means redness, and lupus is an old Latin word which means wolf-like, and they think that we adopted that word for this disease because the skin can look like a wolf bit it. It's a bit of a stretch, but that's where we're at. So systemic lupus erythematosus is an autoimmune disorder that causes systemic organ damage and can cause reddening of the skin. Now, women are at much higher risk for di being diagnosed, in fact, 15 to 1. And this does seem to be hormonally triggered, as it's most common in women of childbearing age, ages 16 to 55. African-American women are at highest risk for this diagnosis and also at highest risk for having poor long-term outcomes as there is social um, injustice and inequalities in um, access to health care for chronic diseases. Now, if you have someone in your family who has had a, a diagnosis of lupus or even other autoimmune disorders, you are at higher risk um, due to that genetic predisposition. So how does lupus start? Well, the body starts attacking itself and it's caused by some kind of trigger from the environment that causes this inflammatory reaction to start in the first place. And those inflammatory reactions can include things like pregnancy. Remember, this is very hormonally induced, um, exposure to sunlight, um, and any other thing that kind of gets the uh, immune system going, illness, major surgery, exposure to silica dust, and even allergic reactions to medication. So something triggers the immune system to kind of go crazy, and then it kind of loses control. And so it starts developing these antibodies against its own cells and starts attacking its own cells. And these antibodies start clumping up together, as you see here in this immune complexes. And those clumps start um, clogging up our organs in our joint spaces, in our kidneys, lung, heart, brain, skin. And so the, the complications you see from lupus have to do with these immune complexes clogging up um, our organs and causing organ damage. Now, the, it, lupus is difficult to diagnose because it doesn't follow the same pattern for each person. In fact, there are 17 different classifications um, to diagnose lupus, and a patient have to, has to have four of those in order to be diagnosed. And so which four a patient has can vary from person to person. Some of those characteristics of lupus can include ulcerations in the mouth, chest pain or shortness of breath, joint pain and arthritis uh, due to those immune complexes clumping up in the joint spaces, um, kidney damage, and that um, classic butterfly rash across the face, and even something called Raynaud syndrome, where um, the patient's fingers and toes turn blue or white when they're experiencing significant stress or cold. And this patient is gonna go through periods of flare-up and periods of remission. So in a flare-up, they're gonna be experiencing all those symptoms that they get, and then they'll go through periods of remission where they will have little to no symptoms. How is lupus diagnosed? Well, there is no blood test specific to diagnosing lupus. So it really is based on um, assessing the patient, doing a full um, physical exam and a history to look for four of those 17 characteristics of lupus. Now we can do a laboratory test on um, those ANA antibodies, and, and those can indicate that the patient may have lupus, but they're not definitive. 
Other lab studies we can look at would be something like a CBC, looking for low white count, low red blood cell count, or low platelet count. We can also look for damage in specific organs, things like um, renal function tests, um, BUN and creatinine, for example. And we can look for nonspecific indicators of immune um, infla inflammation, uh, meaning um, that, that C-reactive protein or an ESR. Now remember, there is no specific cure for lupus. It's a chronic disease that the patient will have for the rest of their life. And there are complications that can even lead to death for this patient. And so good management is going to be key to helping the patient have a good quality and quantity of life. So some of that medic medical management and treatment is gonna be avoiding prolonged sun exposure, which is a trigger for their flare-ups. And when they do go out in the sun, making sure that they're using SPF 50 or higher. Encouraging good diet, good sleep, good exercise and periods of rest. Wanting to kind of keep their, their body um, healthy and calm and stress-free to avoid some of those triggers. Now, when those immune complexes clump up and they get stuck in different organs, it can cause organ damage. And so there are a couple of surgical options for patients who have um, organ damage that, that they really need help with. So specifically renal transplants for patients who get kidney failure from their lupus um, and joint replacements, um, specifically knees and hips can be replaced if there's significant joint damage and arthritis um, due to complications of lupus. Now, in terms of medications, there's typically four categories of medications we think of for lupus, anti-malarial drugs, NSAIDs, glucocorticosteroids, and Belumbob, which is a newer drug on the market. Now, we've talked about some of these already. So there's two of these categories I want to highlight right now, and that's the anti-malarial and the Belumbob. So an anti-malarial drug that is used for lupus commonly is hydroxychloroquine. And you may recall at the beginning of the pandemic when there was all that hype that hydroxychloroquine might be you know, the saving grace of, of COVID-19 and it was going to cure everything. And what happened actually is there was a run on the pharmacies to get hydroxychloroquine and providers were prescribing it. Um, but patients with lupus were actually having a hard time getting this medication and then having bad flare-ups because they couldn't access the medication that they normally had. So um, it, we don't really understand why this anti-malarial drug works for lupus, but it does and it prevents um, or reduces the impact of those flare-up syndrome. A couple of things on this is just a few tablets of this can be fatal to children. So it's really important we teach patients to store them properly, that the patients avoid alcohol while taking these because they can be liver toxic. Um, there is a risk for retinal toxicity, which means it can lead to blindness. And so patients need to have a good eye exam by an ophthalmologist before starting this. And then every six months to a year after that to avoid any complications with their eyes. And the most common side effects are going to be abdominal pain and nausea, which usually um, get better over time. Now let's talk about Balumbab or Benlista. It's a biologic, it's only been on the market for 10 or so years, and it's a monoclonal antibody, which reduces the inflammatory response and kind of blocks our B cells from creating more antibodies against our own cells. And so it is an, an immunosuppressant. And so just like steroids, since it's an immunosuppressant, we have to make sure that patients um, are avoiding getting sick because they're going to be immunosuppressed and not as able to fight off infection. Now, side effects from um, this biologic can include allergic reactions to the medication, mood changes like depression or suicidal ideation, leukopenia and infections from being immunosuppressed and some GI upset. This medication is given via IV infusion. It starts out bi-weekly and then patients move to monthly infusions. And patients need to know that this medication can take up to six months to even start taking effect. And so they're not gonna see a change from this medication right away, but it is proving to really be helpful in, in um, changing the way the immune response is going in the body. Now, 
Remember, when we have these um, immune complexes, these immune antibodies, they clump up together and then they get stuck places in the body. They get stuck in the bloodstream. They get stuck in the heart, in the lungs, in the brain, in the kidneys, in the joint spaces, and in the skin. And so all of the complications we're going to see are going to be related to these clusters of immune complexes causing damage. And so we can see things like kidney failure, heart disease, lung disease, um, hypercoagulation leading to blood clots and blood clots lead to things like heart attacks and strokes. We can see um, joint damage and an increased risk for infection because the body is so busy fighting itself that it's not great at fighting off foreign invaders. As always, let's go through the nursing process as it relates to lupus. Okay, so nursing management. What are we going to do? First, we're going to assess. So what are we going to look for in our assessments? We're going to look for those ANA antibodies and um, look for any of those signs and symptoms of lupus, those 17 different characteristics that can be common with lupus. Nursing diagnosis for a patient, nursing problems for a patient diagnosed with lupus are going to be things like fatigue, altered skin integrity, and altered self-image due to um, the things like the butterfly rash that the patient can have. In terms of interventions, the first thing we're going to do is once we know someone has lupus, here are the assessments we're going to make. We're going to check their vital signs. Patients with lupus are at risk for high blood pressure um, and low oxygen levels. We're going to do a health history, asking about their flare-ups and how their symptoms are going. We're going to do a head-to-toe assessment. Remember, any organ essentially in their body can have complications. So it's important that we're thorough and looking for anything abnormal. And then those lab values we talked about the um, inflammatory markers, the CS, um, C-reactive protein and the ESR. We're gonna look at a CBC for the white count, for the red count and for platelets. Um, and then looking for um, organ specific labs as well, like the BUN and creatinine for kidneys. All right, in terms of actions to take, we're gonna give them medications as ordered and we're gonna do a lot of teaching. Remember, this is a chronic disorder that patients are mostly managing on their, at, on their own at home. And we want them to have a lack of flare-ups and have good quality life. And so we're gonna teach about the disease process so that they know what they have. We're gonna teach about the importance of very strong sunscreen, SPF 50 or higher, teaching energy comfort, conservation and how to prioritize important activities so that they have periods of rest keeping up to date on immunizations so that they don't get any other infections since they are immunocompromised. We wanna encourage them to avoid oral contraceptives because there is an increased risk for blood clots with contraceptives and patients with lupus are already at risk for increased um, blood clots. Now, that being said, it's important that women do not get pregnant during a flare up as it can make their symptoms so much worse. So there would need to be considered other methods of contraceptive to avoid pregnancy during flare ups. And then these patients are going to need a lot of specialists on their team. Um, specifically, they're going to need a rheumatologist uh, to to kind of guide their their treatment as a immune specialist, but they also are probably going to have a nephrologist who follows their kidney function, a cardiologist who follows their heart, a pulmonologist who follows their lungs. They will probably have a lot of different resources and making sure that they have the referrals that they need, not to mention referrals to things like support groups and mental health care that are going to help get them through. And finally, how are we gonna know when we did a great job giving this care to this patient with lupus? Well, we're gonna see that they're being compliant with their treatment regimen, which is gonna help them have the best quality of life and making sure that they're following up with those referrals as appropriate. And then we're gonna make sure that they're able to complete those activities of daily living, that they have the quality of life to do so. And that's gonna wrap it up for our chat on lupus. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.